Our next topic is ancient Greek philosophy, and we're going to start off with in this lecture with some context so that you can know what was going on with Plato and uh, what was going on sort of behind the dialogues that we're reading. So the first point to talk about is classical Athens, which is the setting for all of these dialogues, and it was where Plato and Socrates lived and grew up, and it was sort of uh, kind of inspiring the intellectual background which Plato was writing in. So classical Athens was one of the ancient Greek city-states, and uh, it was notable in part because it was run democratically. So democratically didn't mean everybody gets a vote, uh, rather a relatively limited group of people got to vote. So it was men over uh, the age of 20 were allowed to vote, but not all men. It was all the citizens and all the specifically non-slave citizens. So what was society like? So you had uh, men and women, women mostly confined to the home, not allowed to participate in politics children not allowed to participate in politics, so that rules out a good chunk of the society. You take the rest of the society, everybody who was not a citizen of Athens, so everybody who was sort of uh, foreign-born or their families were foreign-born, they were descendants of foreigners, uh, these people were not participants in the democracy. Uh, they're known as... Um, That's the wrong button. Uh, they were known as uh, medics. That's the Greek word for uh, non-citizen residents. And so there were a fair amount of medics in ancient Athens, and they didn't have a vote. There were also quite a few slaves in uh, Athens. So uh, the many of the Greek city-states, maybe all of the Greek city-states, the economy depended in large part on slavery and the slaves did not get a vote. So it was only the free non-medic men over the age of 20 who participated in democracy. And it was basically a direct democracy. You would have these big meetings and everybody would come and just vote on stuff. The other main part of ancient Athenian democracy was the court system. So the court system was very similar. Uh, it was just a bunch of people come together and listen to the trial and then vote on the outcome. However, it the age cutoff was 30. So the courts were slightly more refined in the sense that you had to be 30 years old to be a juror. And so when you're picturing both the sort of citizen assembly and the courts, keep in mind, these are like big meetings. So thousands of people could come to these things. Uh, and uh, so eventually we're, one of the dialogues is going to occur in court. And so you picture sort of giving speeches to hundreds or thousands of people uh, and then everybody just votes on the outcome. So it's a sort of interesting way to run a city-state. So that's one, well, that's everything basically to know about uh, classical Athens. The fact that this was a whole democracy and all these uh, male citizens were sort of running everything gave the whole city-state a sort of, I don't know, a kind of public-centered <laughs> uh, feeling in the sense that people were very involved in uh, politics. They would show up to these uh, meetings and decide matters of state. And so that's helpful to keep in mind, especially when we read the uh, the Apology. And it's also, well, yeah, that's, so that's enough. So now moving on to Plato, who is the guy who wrote all the stuff we'll be reading. So we have his uh, birth in around 429 and his death 448 or 347 BCE. Plato was an aristocrat, so he was from a very rich family. He didn't work for a living. He just had uh, an estate and plenty of slaves, and he, he had income he was earning from that. And so he got to <laughs> do whatever he wanted, and what he wanted to do was philosophy mostly. So Plato was one of Socrates' students. Socrates never taught uh, officially, he didn't set up a school or anything like this, but uh, people like to hang out with him and follow him around and learn from him. And Plato was one of his best students. Plato uh, seemed to look up to Socrates in a lot of ways. Oh, we have pictures of Plato and Socrates down here. This is Plato on the right. Uh, he looked up to Socrates in a lot of ways, and a lot of his dialogues feature a character named Socrates. How much the character in the dialogue 
named Socrates is similar to the historical Socrates, varies from dialogue to dialogue. Uh, the Apology and also the Euthyphro and the Crito are maybe sort of closer to the historical Socrates than some of the other Socratic dialogues. The Symposium is maybe like halfway historical, and then there are some dialogues where it seems like Socrates is not really supposed to represent the actual Socrates. He's just a character. Um, but Plato wrote dialogues, as you'll see when we read, and it's good to think about the dialogues both as works of philosophy and also as literary texts. So since we're a philosophy class, we're going to be mostly focused on the dialogue or on the philosophical content, but it's not like you can divorce the one from the other. He wrote dialogues on purpose. The sort of the structure of the dialogues has a literary form, not just a philosophical content. We're not reading the most literary of the dialogues, although the symposium gets close, uh, but uh, it is sort of worth keeping in mind that Plato as an author uh, is more than just a philosopher, he's a writer of dialogues. And uh, beyond that, we'll just get to see what Plato thinks about things as we read the dialogues. Uh, we'll get quite a bit up front in the symposium and then more as we go on. Socrates, you'll notice, was born much er well, not much earlier than Plato, but uh, 40 years, 30 years? Yeah, 30 years, 40 years, 40 years, I don't know, I can't do math, 40 years before Plato, so uh, he was relatively old uh, by the time Plato was born, and uh, he, Socrates died also, uh, like, not long after Plato, I don't know, 30 years after Plato was born, he died by execution, we're going to read about that uh, in the Apology, so Socrates was not an aristocrat, he came from fairly modest uh, a fairly modest upbringing. It's not clear exactly how rich or poor he was. It seems like by the end of his life he was relatively poor, so you'll see him talk about that in the Apology. Uh, he was distinguished as a soldier. We know this about him. Uh, he will get a bit more of his life when we read about the Apology, so the Apology kind of has a bit of a background on Socrates's life, but there is some background on Socrates that we won't get in the Apology, but it is nice to have for that and for the Symposium, and that involves the Peloponnesian War. So the Peloponnesian War lasted quite a while, notice 431 to 404, so that's almost 30 years of war, and this was between uh, basically Athens and Sparta, another city-state in classical Greece, uh, and it wasn't just Athens and Sparta, but they were both forming alliances with other city-states. And uh, this was a conflict that Athens eventually lost, uh, and there are two kind of key things to keep in mind here. So first, uh, one key figure in the conflict was Alcibiades, or Alcibiades, depending on how you want to pronounce it. So he was an Athenian aristocrat uh, in the sort of same circles as Plato, and also Socrates got to hang out with the aristocrats because a lot of the aristocrats liked him. So Alcibiades was in these social circles and largely responsible for stoking the Peloponnesian War. He was one of the Athenian generals who was saying, look, we can go get Sparta. We can defeat them. Uh, this can be a great victory for us. Uh, for various political reasons, Alcibiades was sort of excluded from the war itself, and the war started to go badly, and uh, he was like, well, I was... I've, uh, like, I was the chief proponent of this war, now I'm not in charge of it, and it's going badly, I'm going to be in trouble, uh, maybe I'd do better off if I swap sides. So he defected to Sparta part way through the Peloponnesian War. He said to Sparta, hey, um, I know what I'm doing, uh, Athens won't put me in charge of the armies, so maybe you put me in charge and I can do good for you. Uh, that, <laughs> that did work. Sparta uh, did very well against the Athenians with Alcibiades' help. The Athenians were not very happy about this. Uh, he was already kind of on the outs with the Athenians for, again, just weird political reasons. Eventually, he did swap back to the Athenian side, so he sort of defected again to Athens, and people were sort of relatively cool on him. One of the reasons for that is his earlier defection to the Spartans and what happened at the end of the Pel Peloponnesian War, which is when Athenian democracy was briefly... Uh, 
restricted, put down, the Spartans had won the war and they took over Athens effectively. They installed their own uh, uh, leadership and, and specifically they put in charge these people called the Thirty Tyrants. The Thirty Tyrants ruled for about a year in Athens. They seem to have been very, very bad rulers. That was like a bad year. Uh, they killed, they executed thousands of people. Um, and Alcibiades was not one of the 30 tyrants, nor was he directly responsible for them. But you can imagine he was kind of, uh, when Athens is looking at Sparta and not being very happy about losing the war and not being very happy about these 30 tyrants, you can imagine that Alcibiades was sort of looked at badly as being partially responsible for this because he kind of got them into the war in the first place. And then especially he fought on Sparta's side for a while. So Alcibiades very uh, not liked. You see, he dies right around the time of the Thirty Tyrants. He actually dies unrelated to the Thirty Tyrants. Eventually he left Athens and he went off to, I don't know, Persia or something and got killed for reasons that we don't quite understand. So it's not like he was involved in this, but uh, his name was not a good name. So notice the time Alcibiades died, 404, the time that the Thirty Tyrants ruled, 404 to 403, pretty close in time to when Socrates was executed, 399. And when we read the Apology, uh, we'll have occasion to think more about this. The reason I bring this up now, rather than when we read the Apology, is that Alcibiades shows up in the Symposium. So uh, look forward to uh, seeing what that's like. And the reason I bring this up now instead of in front of the Symposium is that this is going to be relevant both to the Symposium and to uh, the Apology. So it makes sense to get this out in the beginning. And uh, so you have these sort of three characters, Plato, Socrates, and Alcibiades, in your head to uh, get ready to see how they interact in the dialogues that we read. 